Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event from the Peterson Institute of International Economics in Washington, DC. Um, it's interesting for me to moderate this discussion of a question that seems to be on everyone's mind. What is happening in the Chinese economy? Is it getting steadily back to a smooth growth path as suggested by Chinese ambassador Xi Feng's recent Washington Post guest column? Or is it suffering from a breakdown in its long-term social contract? Where is the world's second largest economy headed? We have a great panel for you today to discuss these issues. In order in which they will be speaking, let me briefly introduce our panel. First up will be Dr. Nicholas Lardy. Nick is a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, and he's a well-known expert on the Chinese economy. He joined the Institute in 2003 and served as the Institute's Anthony M. Solomon Senior Fellow until 2021. Nick's most recent book is The State Strikes Back, The End of Economic Reform in China. Next up will be Tianlei Huang. Tianlei is a research fellow and the China Program Coordinator at the Peterson Institute. He joined the Institute as a research analyst in 2019. His most recent work for PIE is a detailed examination of China's housing market slowdown and the implications for Chinese households and local governments. Last but not least, of course, is Dr. Adam Posen. Adam has served as president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics since 2013. Over his career, he has contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal policies in the G20, the challenges of economic integration since the adoption of the euro, China-US economic relations, and developing, helping to develop new approaches to financial recovery and stability. Beginning in 2009, he served a three-year term as an external voting member of the Bank of England's rate-setting monetary policy committee. Under his leadership, PIE has developed research partnerships in the People's Republic of China and deep and longstanding ties with policymakers in other East European, East Asian, European, and North American capitals. Welcome, gentlemen. We look forward to your discussion. Let me just say at the end, I will give more instruction about how people can participate. Please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom to place questions as we move forward. Thank you. Let's turn first to Dr. Nick Lardy to start off our discussion. Nick, the forum is yours. Thank you very much, Mary, for the, for the introduction. And uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, program. The question before us uh, was indicated in the announcement of this program. Does the recent run of negative news uh, indicate a persistent downtrend in China's growth? And my answer to that is, of course, there's a downturn in China's growth. In the first three decades or so, uh, starting in 1978 when reform began, China was growing at around 10%. Uh, in the five years or so prior to the pandemic, it was growing at 6%. In the three years of the pandemic, it was growing at 4%. And in the second quarter, the quarter over quarter annualized growth rate was about 3%. So clearly there's a downward trend. The question I want to address is whether or not this is likely to continue. And um, in other words, is the downward trend going to continue from here? I say maybe, but maybe it's unlikely, at least uh, in the short run, say over the next two to three years. And I say that for several reasons. I begin with noting that in the first half of this year, wages and disposable income were growing quite strongly, much faster than the growth of GDP. Consumption growth was also relatively strong, 8.4%. Nominal GDP growth was 5.4%. So we're seeing very strong consumption growth, which to me doesn't seem consistent with the dominant narrative that confidence in China is falling. Uh, rather, uh, you would not expect in, the, in an era of declining confidence to see uh, household consumption growing substantially faster than GDP, and also substantially faster than the growth of disposable income. So the savings rate seems to be coming down. So we may have seen a turning point in the first half of this year. <clears throat> then I'd like to look at four issues that are sometimes cited as evidence 
that the downturn is likely to continue. The first of these uh, is large additions to household deposits. Uh, this was certainly true during the pandemic, maybe partly due or maybe mostly due to the lockdowns, but the share of disposable income going into deposits in the first half of this year has been declining quite sharply. So the additions to household deposits during the pandemic may say something more about the lockdown than the lack of confidence. Second element that I'm gonna look at, which is sometimes cited, is the decline in imports. In the first seven months, uh, imports into China declined by almost 8%. And the not obvious conclusion would be, well, if import demand is down, that must mean that domestic demand is relatively weak. But most of that decline, indeed all of that decline, is due to falling prices of imports. If we look at imports in volume terms, they actually rose 1% in the first half compared to a decline of 6% in the first half of the previous year. So I think imports are actually signaling rising domestic demand, not falling demand. A third element that many people are pointing to, particularly uh, uh, once we got the data from July, is the threat of deflation. Consumer prices declined uh, slightly uh, in July compared to June. But if you look at the data closely, it turns out most of this decline is due to food prices, which are highly volatile. There was a pork shortage the previous year. The prices spiked up. This year, the prices are much lower. And so the CPI is going down. If you take out food, uh, prices in July actually rose by eight tenths of 1%, which was twice the pace of increase in June. So maybe China will go into deflation, but I think claiming that it's in deflation uh, based on one month of data and not looking at the composition uh, isn't a very sensible way to analyze what's going on. Uh, the fourth uh, element I want to look at is weak private investment. Uh, I'll just give you some figures on the share of investment undertaken by private sector. It peaked in 2015 at around 57%. By 21, it was down to about 55.5%. And then in the first half of this year, it declined to 52%. It's been widely noted that private investment actually shrank slightly for the first time ever in the first half of 2023. So the decline in private investment has been heavily influenced, and I think uh, Tianlei will talk more about this, has been heavily influenced by the shrinking property investment, which is heavily dominated by private firms. If you look outside of the property sector, uh, uh, private investment actually grew in the first half of this year, uh, maybe grew more rapidly than overall private investment. So yes, Private investment is weak, mostly, if not entirely, because of weak property investment. And I think it's likely to continue to be weak. And it's a good thing that it's weakening because they've been over-investing in property. And it would have been better if they started this adjustment a few years ago, but it's certainly better to start it now rather than waiting, uh, waiting a few more years. So I could go into some other reasons, uh, but shortage of time, which lead me to believe that non-property investment could continue to strengthen going forward. But my conclusion is that a further downtrend in the short run uh, from the second quarter of this year is possible, but not highly likely. And obviously the final point is we have to wait for some more data for the second half of this year uh, to get a better grasp on whether or not we're in a persistent downtrend or whether we're leveling off uh, and perhaps even increasing from the 3.2% uh, pace of the second quarter. Thank you, Nick, for that very clear uh, exposition of the numbers. I want to turn now to Tianlei Huang. Tianlei, you've written extensively on the property sector. The um, deflation in the property sector, of course, has been cited as a major reason for softening in the Chinese economy. Uh, it punches above its weight in terms of its influence on households because of the allocation of their assets. So we'd love to hear your broader perspective on what's happening there. 
Thank you, Mary. Um, before I start, let me just say that it's truly an honor to join Nick and Adam on this panel today. Uh, both are my mentors, and I have learned tremendously from both of them over the years. So today's event is very special uh, to me. Uh, like Mary said, I'm going to focus on real estate in my opening remarks today. And my central argument is that real estate is, the, is at the center of China's current economic slowdown, and it will continue to be a drag on China's growth uh, for many years to come. Let me first talk about the role of real estate in China's current economic slowdown. Uh, first, uh, Nick, like Nick mentioned, one of the data points that has been widely discussed lately is domestic private-led fixed asset investment, or private investment to be brief. Private investment in the first half of this year saw an outright contraction of 0.2% in year-over-year -year terms, and the contraction continued through July. Um, at a time when there is no zero COVID restrictions on movement left anymore, an outright contraction in private investment obviously is a very worrying sign. But a closer look at the data shows that the contraction in private investment so far this year can be largely explained by the decline in real estate development investment. Let's not forget that uh, real estate development investment is an important part of the reported fixed asset investment statistics uh, in China. For a long time, about 80% of all real estate development investment in China is undertaken by private developers, and real estate development investment is around one third of all private investment. And real estate de development investment in China has been on the decline since the second quarter of 2022, and it is now dropped to similar levels in 2018 and 2019. The contraction in property development investment so far is much larger than the contraction in, in overall private uh, investment, suggesting uh, that the property downturn is likely a major cause for the decline in private investment uh, so far this year. In fact, um, in sectors outside of real estate, private investment expanded nearly 10% in the first half of 2023, and private investment in manufacturing and infrastructure was particularly strong. Therefore, the recent decline in private sector investment seems more of a reflection of the sector-specific weaknesses in real estate. And the ongoing corrections in China's real estate market will likely continue to worsen private investment data, um, given the contraction of real estate development investment will likely continue uh, for many years. Second, uh, the surge in household bank deposits is also partly caused by the property downturn. After some temporary improvements in real estate sales earlier this year, the drop in property sales in recent months has uh, deepened. And sales measured by square footage through July dropped by nearly 7%, though this is still much better than the nearly 30% drop in most of 2022. At the same time, households were not taking out uh, mortgage loans to buy real estate, and household mortgage loan balance uh, has declined slightly since early 2022. The continued drop in real estate sales and the declines in new mortgage loans mean that the part of savings that households would have spent on their down payments have now become bank deposits and other kinds of um, assets. And as Adam argues in his reason for the fifth article, a surge in bank deposits reflects the liquidity preferences of households wanting to park their money uh, in more liquid forms of assets out of concerns about the, the outlook of the economy. If the recent um, housing stimulus package, including the lowering of minimum down payment requirements to 20% for first-time buyers uh, nationally, and uh, other policies on mortgage rates and the broader definition uh, of first-time buyers who can enjoy a preferential mortgage rates turn out to be effective and real estate sales can pick up again, uh, then bank deposits will likely go down as households draw on their savings to buy more homes. But that is a big if. The, the effect of the most recent stimulus package uh, may vary across cities. In fact, before the People's Bank and the new financial regulator um, announced the nationwide lowering of minimum down payment requirements a week ago, dozens of smaller Chinese cities had already lowered down payment requirements to 20%, uh, 
plus uh, coupled with other policy adjustments, uh, but sales barely picked up. So the new stimulus may have little to no effect in these smaller cities, most of which are suffering from net population outflows. However, the stimulus package may help revive the housing demand in top tier cities, at least in the short term, where buyers until most recently were adopting a, a wait and see attitude. After the stimulus was announced last week, uh, uh, housing activities picked up in those uh, top tier cities almost immediately reflecting the strong demand in those large cities that are driven by uh, more long-term factors, including uh, unstopped population inflows. Therefore, it is likely, uh, in my view, that a recovery in housing demand, if there will be one, will concentrate in top-tier cities uh, and the divergence between top-tier cities and lower-tier cities in terms of housing activity will probably become ever more uh, pronounced going forward. Third, household consumption and real estate related durable goods, including home appliances, furniture, and beauty materials, is unsurprisingly on the decline because of the property downturn. Retail sales in those items in the first half of this year is nearly 15% lower than the level in 2021. And again, if real estate sales can pick up uh, again as a result of the recent policy stimulus, consumption in those real estate related goods may also see some uh, recovery. However, beyond some possible short-term recovery in housing activity, real estate will almost certainly play a smaller role in the Chinese economy uh, going forward. The Chinese property sector has already reached the inflection point. Um, although some marginal improvements may be possible, I think no stimulus package will be able to bring the sector back to the kind of fast growth that we saw in the first two decades uh, in this century. This is because how housing stock is already way above uh, the level that households in China can absorb. Uh, plus overall urbanization is slowing. Although, although internal migration is still very much going on despite uh, the policy constraints, especially uh, from uh, the household registration system and the pop and China's population is starting to shrink. Um, so demand in the long term is shrinking. And per capita residential space for Chinese households has already increased dramatically over the past two decades. Um, uh, it's now uh, more than 40 square uh, meters, so 430 square uh, feet per person, reaching developed world standard. Um, there will still be demand from new migrants uh, and households wanting better quality uh, housing, but overall housing demand uh, in the country simply does not have much room to grow. And given the past overinvestment in housing in China, the ongoing corrections in real estate market may continue for years, if not decades. And that multi-year or even decade-long uh, housing downturn obviously has uh, serious implications for many parts of the economy, including local government uh, finances. Land sales dropped, my dropped by more than 20% in 2022, while real estate-related taxes dropped by 8%. Overall, local government fiscal revenue uh, still saw a decline last year, despite the very uh, sizable increase in intergovernmental transfers from the central government in Beijing. And by the way, by, uh, uh, by uh, overall local government fiscal revenue, I mean the sum of uh, general public budget revenue and uh, the government funds budget revenue not taking into account so, uh, the state uh, capital management budget and the social security budget. So local governments now are in desperate need to find new and more sustainable sources of revenue. A nationwide property tax is a possible candidate, but given that households may be both unwilling and incapable of paying the tax, it seems to me that its nationwide rollout is quite unlikely anytime soon. And this means other um, sources of local revenues uh, also need to be explored. And one revenue source uh, that will not impose an additional tax burden on households is the local state enterprise sector. Local governments can either draw greater dividends from their uh, local SOEs or outright privatize some underperforming um, SOEs locally. Um, the current housing downturn and the vulnerability of uh, local government finances exposed during the housing downturn, I think, may turn out to be a good opportunity for China to, to start a new round of uh, uh, privatization uh, campaign. Some partial privatization of the local state sector would not only help 
uh, with local government finances, but also help revive the private sector and raise deficiency in resource allocation. However, I'm uh, fully aware of the political controversy when it comes to privatization in the context of China. And given the policy preferences of the current Chinese leadership, this may not seem uh, feasible. Aside from uh, searching for new sources of revenue, um, the central government really should step up and take on more using its own balance sheet. The Chinese central government has always been cautious uh, when it comes to managing its fiscal deficit. The government um, has actually been running a contractionary fiscal policy during COVID, my own calculations show. Um, and, and there are mainly two problems with the, with the government's fiscal policy. The central government not only set very conservative um, deficit targets every year, but also often underspend the budgets approved by the Chinese legislature. So now it is really time for uh, the Chinese central government to use the policy room, uh, to use the policy space that uh, it has reserved over the years to deal uh, with the current uh, slowdown. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tian Wang. That was just a different course, thinking about the causes of the downturn, the current state of play in the sector, and even looking at some possible policy prescriptions. So thank you so much. I want to turn it now over to Adam Posen. Adam, of course, so many of us have read your recent piece in the Foreign Affairs, and um, we're hoping you bring a little bit of the heat. So over to you. Thank you, Mary, and thanks to you, Tianlei, Nick, as well as our other China colleagues at Peterson, Martin Chersempa and Yeling Tang, from whom I learned so much. Um, but this is obviously just my views. Like uh, certain people in China at Peterson, we believe in letting a thousand flowers bloom on these important issues. Uh, I actually am gonna use slides if I can share screen. Great. And so I'm here to talk about the end of China's economic miracle. And what I'm, I'll make clear what I mean by that. Um, what we've seen, of course, and it's attracted a lot of the attention, is the gyrations in outlook for Chinese economic GDP growth. And this is from the Financial Times. It gives you some sense of the fluctuations in average with others going much higher and much lower. Um, I started working on this project in March. Um, and at that time I was forecasting a lower growth rate for China than this 5.3, more like four and a half, and have since felt confirmed in that. Now the question isn't so much just what's going on with the forecast, all the reasons that Nick and Tianle have gone through for reasons not to get too upset. The question is, how are we at a turning point? And I would argue we are at a macroeconomic turning point for China. What has happened is a lasting shift in household and small and medium enterprise behavior towards self-insurance liquidity that I will illustrate with a few charts. This has been caused by a jump in the Chinese Communist Party's amount of arbitrary interference in everyday commercial life. This is embodied but not limited to the zero COVID policy, which made very visible, tangible in your face for average Chinese, the fact that the government could take away their property rights in a way that either anti-corruption campaigns affecting the 7% of the population that's in the Communist Party or going after tech oligarchs, which is a handful of people did not. For most of the time since Deng, the China, like many other autocratic regimes, has allowed essentially a no politics, no problem approach. That as long as you did not protest in Tiananmen Square or in Hong Kong, as long as you were not an ethnic Uyghur Muslim, if you were an average Han Chinese, you could go about your day-to-day -day business. Yes, you'd have to be deferential to party officials. Yes, you'd occasionally have to pay a bribe. But for the most part, you could just go about your life, no politics, no problem. What has happened is starting with around 2015, President Xi has been increasingly interventionist. And again, with the zero COVID and reversal of zero COVID has taken it to a new level. This has resulted in a persistently lower investment in durable goods consumption, more movement into low risk savings, 
And this will ultimately, as we're already seeing, create lower response to stimulus policies by the government. In the end, if you believe the government is arbitrary, and as with zero COVID can say, we'll take a long time, we'll take a short time, put it in this city, we'll take it away, you don't let yourself react to macroeconomic policies in the same way because you know they can be reversed or extended at any time. This is a general macroeconomic result, but it's particularly true of authoritarian regimes. Now, this is a turning point, not just in behavior, but also for Xi and the Chinese leadership. It is possible that if you get less stimulus response, less vibrant private sector, that she may give in even further to his already well-established tendencies to favor state-owned enterprises, to favor manufacturing, to favor industrial policy in that direction. And that could lead him to increase the barriers or the discouragements of investing abroad and more into doing things at home. Obviously, the security background plays into this. If that is the route that she goes, then we are down a road we've seen before in Latin America, we've seen before in Russia and Turkey and Hungary and Venezuela, that once you start putting up barriers, you start increasing the incentive for people to look for exits. And it can become a feedback loop upon itself. In my article, the editors gave the title, How Beijing Struggles Could Be an Opportunity for Washington. And I want to emphasize the opportunity is not so much Chinese weakness. It's an opportunity for the US to reorient its China economic policy from a sanctions orientation towards a suction orientation, to drawing out capital, financial, technological, human from China. It will not happen in a vast way, but as was successfully done with respect to the fascist economies in the 30s and then with respect to the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s, this is a way of putting economic pressure on the regime, inducing them to put up more controls and thereby hurt their own performance. Now, I call this economic long COVID. And just as Nick has done and Tianle has said, I don't view this as a collapse of either the Chinese economy or regime. We've seen with the recent economic data a lot of exaggerated claims and forecasts. Chen Yanlei has done an excellent job of talking about the financial and real estate sector problems that could be surmounted as before. We've seen China get past these things previously, just as Japan and Korea did. Yes, it's a drag, but restructuring and bailouts can kick the can down the road quite successfully. The problem is that it is no longer credible for the Xi regime to constrain itself from future intrusion. That is the, what happens when you violate the no politics, no problem compact. This is the way in which I think it's important to see the communist regime in China as part of an authoritarian political economy that we've seen elsewhere. And this is what I would identify as was in part the Chinese economic miracle that from Deng until roughly 2015, the authority of the Chinese Communist Party was not in doubt, but they did not exercise it in a way that interfered with day-to-day -day commercial life for average Chinese. And so the result now is a sluggishness, what I call an immune response to policy, and which leads to a less dynamic economy. Now, many other factors could offset the downshift in growth temporarily. Nick gave some for why you might see a rebound the second half of this year. I don't share that view, but I think it's entirely plausible. I don't rule it out. Similarly, Tianle spoke about some of the things that could be done importantly in his work on local governments and local finances on the fiscal side. But I think the important point to recognize is this is an ongoing persistent change, a shift in the nature and the trend of growth. And this is about not going to suddenly lead to breakdown because in, again, going back to a political economy of authoritarianism, initially when you see these kinds of crackdowns, the people are more obedient because they are more scared and they have fewer options. It's only over time that the problems continue to accumulate. Now, the important context to understand, and this is taken by a recent paper by Desires, Moore, and Ortiz, is just how different Chinese savings behavior is. If you look at the left, this is the savings rate across advanced economies, all of which shoot up during COVID and come way back down. If you look at the right panel, the black line is China. It doesn't shoot up during COVID. It doesn't come way back down. It doesn't move. Singapore displays a similar pattern to the other rich countries. 
This is the backdrop, why it's not about just, are we disappointing forecasts? Are we disappointing the current outlook? The issue is, given how important the COVID shutdown and shock were, the fact that China did not respond a lot to reopening is a huge deal, and all your interpretation should be conditioned on that. And Nick mentioned about consumer confidence. This is the National Bureau of Statistics consumer confidence numbers. Again, that there was not so much that it's low, but that there has been no rebound seen during the period of reopening and recovery. This is a very striking, unusual fact, and it needs to be understood. I argued, as I said, that there was a break point in with zero COVID and the Chinese writer Morong Shakun, forgive my pronunciation, uh, made this point last spring. And in my article, I talk about some more examples and observations around this. This was a very major shift for China. Additionally, what tends to be overlooked is that at the same time, China's parliament has increased the centralization and the power to put in emergency laws with a smaller and smaller group of the People's Congress responding to the Politburo and the Central Committee. Chinese people are aware of these changes and that is what underlies the macro performance change I was talking about. So of course we now see the totalitarian or authoritarian belief that you don't talk about problems. This is just a month ago, right around the time my article came out at the start of August, Chinese economists are told not to be negative. That's not a causal factor, but it gives you a sense of the spirit of the situation. As my colleagues Tian Lei Huang and Nicola Veron have done with their tracker, we can see that the share of state-owned enterprises in total capitalization has been going up since roughly COVID. Other charts you can look at from the work of Nick Lardy and earlier Tian Lei with Nick Lardy can talk about dating various turning points in the amount of credit going to state-owned enterprises versus private sector enterprises in roughly 2015, 2016. There has been a fundamental turning of the Chinese economy to go with this shock. And so I focus on three things that I think reflect consumer, household, small business behavior, the average Chinese. The things going on with the tech Giants, things going on the state-owned enterprises, with real estate developers all matter, but ultimately they're less important and more soluble than something that affects the Chinese economy as a whole in general. This is the look at public and private investment, and we can see how much it's dropped and that there's no response after COVID. Now, Nick argues and, and Tianlei points out that some of this is real estate, and I do not deny that at all, obviously. But remember, if real estate is below, and manufacturing and infrastructure, that is the state-owned enterprise sectors are growing at 10%. That means SME sector is growing investment barely at all. And that is what we know is going on. It makes sense because most real estate invest, excuse me, most small and medium enterprise investment is financed out of savings and out of real estate. We also know that durable goods consumption has been going down since roughly the time that she started turning the economy. But again, the fact is not just that it's flat, but that it hasn't gone up at all after the, after the shutdown in China. Again, very strong contrast to other economies that had opening and shutdown under COVID. And this represents, I would argue, the liquidity preference, the lack of desire to tie up assets that can be expropriated or interfered with and keep things in cash and cash-like deposits. And that's what we see, that savings went up and continued to rise. This is a representation of household deposits, not savings, as I erroneously had in the first print of the article. But that's important because this means that deposits are rising more than savings as a whole, which means that people are not only putting more money as it comes in into deposits, but that they are shifting other forms of savings into deposits. Again, the real estate plays a role in this, but this is an ongoing process of several years that was forced by COVID. The collapse of the real estate of great developers is only over the last year or two. So, we are at a macroeconomic turning point for China. This is about a lasting shift in 
household and small and medium enterprise behavior towards self-insurance liquidity. It's caused by a jump in the Chinese Communist Party arbitrary interference in everyday commercial life, which is very real for the average Chinese. And this has ended in a pattern we've seen with authoritarians, the no politics, no problem. And that was the miracle that for 35 years, the Chinese Communist Party leadership restrained itself from doing this. But once they have broken this compact, it's very hard to go back. And so it is not just about disappointing the forecast or perhaps an uptick or a downtick next quarter. It's that I expect there to be lower investment in durable goods consumption, more emphasis on low risk savings and lower response to stimulus policies going forward. Is this a crisis of collapse? Probably not, but this could create a dynamic where she leans further into the state owned enterprise sector further increasing barriers to exit, which will in turn induce more self-insurance and more desire for exit. And finally, though this is not the focus of today's call, I would emphasize that the opportunity for the US is to reconsider its situation, its approach to China, to be more about pulling stuff out and less about locking things in. As President Biden has mentioned, again, referring to an established political economy literature, that a China that's in greater economic problems may turn out to be more aggressive on the security front. This is possible. There's some evidence in that direction. But more importantly is the evidence about the nature of the shock to the Chinese people. This isn't just about a few top businesses. And it is about the Chinese people not winning their hearts and minds in some abstract liberalism, but day to day providing them the sense that there is an exit and an alternative, which is key to getting things out. Thank you very much. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Adam. You've given us so much to discuss. Um, I think we have lots of questions coming in, which is great. Keep them coming. Um, one of the things I'd like to turn to first is, is this role of consumption and consumption growth, which seems to be at the heart, or, or at least a major difference between Nick's view, which is based more on short-term, medium-term, and Adam's longer uh, thinking about how people are responding to the current climate. Um, Nick, you know, every major Western news outlet seems to be running a story about the malaise of the Chinese consumer. Um, but as you noted, the latest numbers show a rise in consumption spending. Where do you think people are getting this wrong? Um, why the gloom if the numbers are pointing in a different direction? Well, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been traveling frequently to China for more than 45 years. And the one thing that I have learned and probably should have known beforehand is that China is a very large, complex place. And you can find whatever you're looking for. Uh, so newspaper people that go out and interview a handful of people who uh, claim they're not spending and that they're worried about this and that, uh, that may be true for them, but, you know, it's 1.4 billion people. So it, I think it's risky to generalize based on a small non-random sample. And I also <clears throat> wonder whether China is really much different than the United States. And Adam could probably shed more light on this than I could, but you look at the U.S. unemployment at a historic low, real wages rising more rapidly than any time in recent history. But when you go out and do surveys and ask people how they're feeling about the economy, you tend to get very negative answers. So uh, even when some of the <clears throat> metrics seem positive, people's attitudes can be in the other direction. And the same thing may be true in China. I don't know. It's something to do with human psychology. Okay, Adam, back over to you. You know, consumption rose in the first half of 2023, but at the same time, households seem to be increasing their bank deposits. You know, as someone who people look to for thinking about the future, what signs are you going to be watching to see if the impact of zero COVID on households is as enduring as your uh, article and your, your uh, discussion suggests to us? Thank you, Mary. And I agree with Nick, the perceptions can vastly differ from the economic figures, but it's very different in the US and 
China. The issue again isn't whether Chinese consumption pops up or pops down. It's that there was almost no recovery following the reopening. That's the tell. And so the issue right now going forward, what I'm watching for is how much there is a continued response towards liquidity, that is to say, preferring bank deposits or other forms of, of shorter term assets, more liquid assets, and a continued preference in consumption for services over durable goods, including autos. Now, again, part of this is also thinking about the effect the drag from the real estate sector, as Nick and Tianle have both rightly emphasized. And so there the test is, how much does the government's acts, or I should say the party and the state's efforts to deal with the real estate problem are actually effective. If it turns out that they do things that directly address some of these issues, but don't reassure the public, one would expect them to see improvement in markers about financial stability of various sorts with less response on small and medium enterprise investment and consumption. Or one would see changes, recapitalization, consolidation, bailouts in the real estate sector, and some improvement in, in consumption, but not a fundamental change. These are the things that I would be watching for over the next six to 12 months. Thank you, Adam. I think we'll have a lot of eyes on those particular data series. <laughs> Tian Lei. Um, we're getting questions about indebtedness. You know, some observers believe that Chinese households and companies are trying to reduce their level of indebtedness. We also have concerns about local governments and perhaps a crisis there uh, with debt. Do you believe that the Chinese is in a, a Chinese economy is in a so-called balance sheet recession? Oh uh, well, thanks, Mary. Um, there are probably some early signs of a balance sheet recession. For example, uh, as Adam alluded to in his remarks, households and businesses are uh, borrowing um, less, investing less, and consumer uh, consuming uh, less. And as uh, the total, as China's total social financing, which is its own measure of total credit that goes to the real economy, uh, in July shows um, households and business businesses are indeed borrowing a lot less. Uh, and also households are trying to repay their mortgage that uh, early. So those were the early signs of a balance sheet recession. But uh, if we look closer uh, in the household sector, households are trying to repay their mortgage that early because mortgage rates are declining and they're stuck with their old higher uh, mortgage rates. Um, they do that uh, not so much because you know asset prices are falling like really severely that uh, lead uh, their mortgage loans to be in uh, negative equity. In fact, uh, um, declines in real estate prices so far in China have been quite uh, modest, which was partly thanks to uh, the government's intervention, including setting up price floors in uh, some localities. Um, the worst, I guess, in terms of uh, price corrections in the real estate market are probably already behind us. Uh, and um, um, if we look at uh, uh, data related to financial stability, individual mortgage loans remain uh, one of the best uh, uh, quality uh, uh, types of loans on uh, banks' uh, balance sheets. Uh, and overall, uh, household uh, and businesses leverage it, it, is still going up. Uh, it's just going up at a slower uh, pace. And uh, uh, in terms of private investment, as I said in my initial uh, remarks, it's uh, the recent decline is very much a reflection of the sector specific weaknesses in real estate, rather than a reflection of uh, uh, um, the lack of confidence of investors across the board. Um, uh, in other sectors like manufacturing and infrastructure, private investment was still uh, growing quite strongly. So uh, my bottom line here is, uh, despite the early signs, I think China is not uh, yet in a balance sheet recession. Thank you. We have two um, coaches and observers of the Chinese economy. 
asking us about government policy. And I wanted to turn for that, to that for a moment. Um, Yelling Tan, who's a professor at the at or University of Oregon and a non-resident senior fellow with PIIE, um, ask about how the securitization of China's economic agenda impacts its growth outlook. Um, and how exactly will China's bureaucratic agencies implement the call to coordinate security and development? What does this mean moving forward for China's uh, response to current weaknesses in the economy? Similarly, Mary Gallagher from the University of Michigan is asking about what steps the government would take. In her view, there is pressure from both the left and the right, from both uh, status quo and pro-reformers uh, that basically results in a kind of stasis uh, in government policy. So what do we see moving forward from the Chinese government? Will we see um, a, continual, a continuation of statements that the crackdown, for example, on high tech is over? Or will we see some steps forward, some steps back? and it's sort of a muddled response or no response. Uh, Nick, let me start with you. What do we think the Chinese government will be doing over the next, say, half year, year, in response to the current situation? Well, let me begin by saying, I think, you know, I think the emphasis on national security is a clear negative for the economy. The magnitude is very difficult to judge, but the spate of laws that uh, have been promulgated in recent years, uh, including some very recent, are having a very negative effect on foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment in China uh, has been precipitously declining over the last year, year and a half, and there's no sign that it's going to turn around anytime soon. So it's easy to overemphasize how important foreign direct investment is, but it shouldn't be ignored. So that's, I think that's a clear negative uh, as a result of security, the emphasis on national security at the expense of economic growth. Well, I don't expect too much from the government. I, I think that <clears throat> they've tried to slow down the growth of debt uh, since 2017. They've had some success. They don't want to throw that out the window. They're not going to have a big stimulus like they had after the global financial crisis. Uh, so to some extent, they're prepared to accept lower growth rather than have a big stimulus program. And the steps they've taken in property, I think, are emblematic. The, the adjustments that have been made so far are very much uh, at the margin, a little bit of adjustment on mortgage rates, a little bit of adjustment on eligibility to get a mortgage, uh, which may have some modest uh, effect of stabilizing or maybe even uh, slightly improving the property situation. But I think uh, you know they're sticking to the policy that they announced a number of years ago, uh, you know that housing is for living, not for investing or speculating. And I think we have to recognize that the slowdown uh, in part may be due to some of the factors that Adam talked about, but it's also very much due to the change in policy with respect to property, which, uh, as I indicated in my earlier remarks, I think is, is long overdue. They've been overinvesting in property. And the sooner they start uh, you know, unwinding that, uh, the better off they're going to be. Uh, they should have done it years ago, uh, and I hope they stick with it now. Thanks, Nick. That raises a question, I think, about how we view government policy. In, on the one hand, we have um, discourse that suggests that China is pursuing um, a moderate, in some sense, even wise, longer-term policy to deflate a sector that's been um, overextended uh, and a, uh, you know, a persistent th long-term threat to the economy, that is the property sector. Uh, and even when we look at what happened in the tech sector, the view that these guys were getting too big for their britches, that they needed to be brought to heel in some sense, that their, uh, you know, expansion, expansive plans for the economy were in a sense of monopolization, monopolization of the economy, and that the government was justified in perhaps not exactly the way it was done, but in doing what it did. On the other hand, we have Adam's view, which is basically that the government's heavy handedness is actually the source of a lot of the weakness that we're seeing and a threat to the future. 
Adam, how do you reconcile these two views of what the government is trying to do? Are they wise ministers or are they the source of the problem? They're both. Um, just as people have raised in the chat and the Q&A, there are issues in the U.S. None of this is about philosopher kings um, in the Socrates, Plato sense. Although in a sense, that that is the point, that the party used to put a lot more emphasis on technocratic measures and some stability policy. Again, I'm not talking about Mao. I'm talking about since 79. And there is a technocratic school of thought among financial regulators and supervisors, people at the People's Bank, people at the NDRC, who speak as Nick did, as Tianle did, as you just aptly summarized it, Barry, the need to get financial stability further in front and not be so reliant on the boom bust cycle of real estate. The overlay I would put on, however, is that given where the, the Chinese Communist Party leadership and Xi have gone now, it's going to be harder for them to pursue the technocratic course of action, which is to actually create some re major restructuring of the real estate market, imposing losses on a lot of people. And putting in, as Tianle suggests, uh, we can go back to Lu Jiwei's statements about how he wanted China to reform in 2013 and talked about real estate back then. That was sort of the high point of the vision for Chinese economic reform. It's there, but in this more autocratic seeming environment, it's going to be harder for them to be successful. I don't mean literally there will be uprisings and resistance, not at all. What I mean is the effectiveness of the policies will be less than it would have been in a different context, because what they do to intervene will at the same time reinforce some concerns about the party's extension into everyday life. Thank you. I think that gives our, our, our listeners a lot to think about. We're coming toward the end, but we do have um, time for at least one more topic. And there's a lot of questions about US-China relations and about foreign investment. And I wanted to turn to that now, particularly since during her recent trip to Beijing, US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo stated that for US investors, or at least we can think she was speaking of US investors, China had become uninvestable. Um, you know, as someone who's tracked FDI flows for many years, Nick, what do you make of her characterization? Well, I think it's a very good talking point for a commerce secretary who is trying to get the Chinese to adopt, uh, you know, more open uh, policies. So uh, she's she's basically laying down a marker, saying uh, if you don't get back on the reform track and make the environment more. Um, you know, conducive to foreign investment, it's going to continue, uh, continue to decline. So, I think it's you know it's a it's a remark that's been made uh, for more than twenty years by dozens of high uh, you know government officials in the United States. Uh, there's always been an opportunity to liberalize further, to make the environment more open, to get the number of sectors where foreigners are restricted from entering to reduce that and to get a more level playing field. This has been a long-term objective of many, many uh, treasury secretaries, commerce secretaries, and so forth. So she's she's in a, in a, in a well-established uh, tradition making that kind of a remark. Thanks. Tianle, recently the Chinese ambassador to the United States spoke about this issue, at least obliquely. And um, he noted that investment from several major European companies was actually up in the first half of 2023 compared to the similar period a year ago. Um, you know, what do you make of the argument uh, that China is uninvestable? Thanks, Mary. Oh, well, I think we should look at overall FDI inflows rather than FDI inflows from certain companies or certain countries. Um, if if we look at, uh, so there are two uh, official sources uh, that give you uh, uh, FDI inflows data in China. One is MOFCON, the Ministry of Commerce, uh, and their data shows a more modest decline in FDI inflows uh, in the first half of the, this year. 
which is about uh, a negative 10% uh, uh, decline year over year through July this year. Uh, another source is, they, is the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, or SAFE, which uh, compiles China's balance of payment data. And its late, latest BOP data suggests that uh, net FDI inflows in China have collapsed. Uh, the year-over-year -year decline is nearly 90%. Uh, and the July reading, uh, the second quarter of 2023 reading is the lowest in more than uh, two decades. This is, no matter what data series you look at, this is uh, a very worrying uh, sign. I actually think uh, the BOP data may tell us a more complete uh, story in terms of what is happening to FDI inflows in China because the BOP data takes into account uh, of disinvestment of foreign companies as well as uh, uh, retained uh, reinvested earnings of existing foreign investors in China, where we ask MOFCOM data uh, does not take into account disinvestment and it only captures part of reinvested earnings uh, of existing investors. Um, I think these data points show that, you know, um, foreign investors are indeed increasingly cautious about making investments uh, in China out of many reasons, including the government's arbitrary law enforcement, like what happened to a couple of foreign companies earlier uh, this year, and the heightened uncertainty surround the, uh, surrounding the regulatory environment uh, in China, uh, and also probably the, the uncertainty from foreign sanctions uh, and export controls, which are making compliance more uh, tricky and perhaps also tr costly for companies. Um, and that's about direct investment. Uh, if we look at portfolio uh, investment, foreign holdings of Chinese onshore equity has also declined quite a bit in the first half of this year. And of course, that has something to do with the overall market performance uh, in China. The, the Chinese stock market in the first half of this year wasn't doing very well. And foreign holdings of Chinese onshore bonds stay fairly uh, stable. So I think uh, uh, both the portfolio and direct investment data are showing um, that foreign investors are becoming more uh, cautious. Um, and I think another factor that may lead foreign investors to become even more cautious uh, going forward is the fact that China is becoming um, less transparent in terms of data availability. You know, we all know about what happened to the youth employment data series, uh, and it's just one of the many data series that has been uh, discontinued over, over the past couple of years. <laughs> Excuse me. And of course, those uh, data series, uh, foreign investors need those data uh, to inform their uh, decisions in terms of making investments uh, in China. So I really hope uh, the recent uh, declines uh, in FDI inflows and other negative news coming out of China can be a wake up call to Beijing uh, to, you know, uh, um, uh, to let it uh, reflect on some of its policy actions. Great. Thank you so much, Tianlei. Well, I hope that um, those of us who joined us this morning see the, the value in a data-driven approach to thinking about what's going on in the Chinese economy. We saw a difference of opinion on where the Chinese economy is headed, at least in the short run, and um, look forward to engaging with you in the future. We really didn't get a chance to touch very much on U.S.-China relations, something we're also watching very carefully we have a new data, uh, new series that we're starting called Supply Chains on the Move. We hope you'll take a look at the website. In addition to reading the work that Nick and Adam have posted and discussed, we have Tian Lei and Nicola Varone's tracker looking at the cap capitalization of the uh, major Chinese firms. All of this and more on, the, on PIIE's website. So thank you for joining us this morning. Have a wonderful Thursday.